Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Adrian Monk, Managing Director here at the World Economic Forum. Welcome to this opening press conference with our co-chairs for this year's annual meeting of the new champions. Our theme is Shaping Innovative Societies in the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And we have a fantastic group of co-chairs to help us set that agenda. If I can introduce Abby Ramanan, Chief Executive Officer of Impact Vision. Carlos Moedas, Commissioner for Research, Science and Innovation at the European Commission. Ken Hu, Deputy Chairman and Rotating Chair of Huawei Technologies. Matt Hancock, Secretary of State for Health and Social Care in the United Kingdom. Suzanne Fortier, Principal and Vice-Chancellor of McGill University. And Jay Flatley, the Executive Chairman of Illumina. So we're going to be hearing from each of them about their hopes and their thoughts on this year's meeting and what they'll bring to the uh, program and the agenda for this discussion. And then we'll take questions from all of you. So if I can start on my left with Abby. Abby Ramanam, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here as a co-chair. As Adrian said, I am the CEO of a technology company. We develop software for the food system. But I think more importantly for this meeting, I have the privilege of representing the Global Shapers community. Initiated by the World Economic Forum, Global Shapers is a network of inspiring young people under the age of 30, creating positive change in their communities at a local, national, and international level. There is no doubt that young people today have inherited enormous global challenges. And it has been said that we are the first generation living with the sins of our predecessors and the last generation that really has the power to do anything about it. But in my experience, and really exemplified by this community, we have self-organized to address challenges like climate change, youth unemployment, the refugee crisis, and gender equality with courage and to really offer progressive solutions for change. The Global Shapers community now spans 370 hubs in over 165 countries, and this is growing. And I think it is extremely important that young people have a voice because 50% of the world's population is under 30. And we really will define the next century, which I think is also something to be hopeful for. We will also most probably be the first generation to visit Mars making us an interplanetary species, which should be interesting. People speak about their Davos moment, and for me, earlier this year, it was, of course, having the opportunity to interview Jack Ma, and I'm told this is the most streamed session from Davos, but also watching in amazement as Global Shapers discussed drug policy with US senators, impressed their prime ministers, and raised funds to electrify rural villages in India. I would like to share two examples of people who have particularly inspired me from this community. The first is Deepika from the Hyderabad Hub. Global Shapers introduced her to the idea of cities as units of change, and she was so inspired by this that she quit her job in venture capital to start a tech nonprofit focused on making cities more equitable and livable. At Davos, she met with the urban minister of her state, and they are now working together and this wouldn't have been possible without this community. Another example that inspired me is Naomi from the El Salvador Hub. After graduating from MIT, she decided to return to her home, despite many offers um, from the US, and a lot of people asked her why. That was when she found the Global Shapers community in El Salvador, a group of people who had also not given up on their country, and despite it going through some of the darkest times in their history, wanted to stay and continue to stay there so they can create positive change together. The other area I will be focusing on as a co-chair is around technology and entrepreneurship. As I mentioned, I am the CEO of a startup, but I think more broadly than that, we really need to discuss how emerging technologies can be used to benefit all of society. This involves not just designing technical products, but also the ethical frameworks that surround them to ensure they remain human-centered as we face moral questions around bias, exclusion, and in the future, ultimately, what it will mean to be human. China is, of course, blazing a technological trail, particularly in artificial intelligence, with two-thirds of all AI investments being directed here. 
and I very much look forward to learning from and discussing with, with my co-chairs and also the other participants how technology can be used to solve some of the biggest challenges of our time and also how my company, Impact Vision, is using advanced imaging technology and machine learning to create a transparent, waste-free and resilient food system. I also very much hope that while I might be the first from this community to co-chair this conference, this seat will always be occupied by a global shaper from now on. Thank you. That was a great uh, extra bid there for a shaper's <laughs> slot on the, on the co-chair panel. Thank you, Abby. Um, we're lucky to have Carlos Moedas back as a co-chair. Carlos. Thank you very much. Uh, what a great pleasure to be here for uh, the second time as a co-chair. Um, uh, for me, the World Economic Forum has been an inspiration. An inspiration how to create policy. Policy for people and for science. And I think that the way I see my role as a co-chair is twofold. First of all, about the role of science for the creation of jobs and growth. I think that uh, as a politician, I owe it to the people to explain the importance of science and innovation. Um, I remember in 2015, I met exactly at the WEF uh, the former president, Shimon Peres, and he had this uh, quote of his that he used to say, um, you cannot escape poverty without science, right? And, and I think that is something that we should repeat because politically, in a lot of countries, is not central to the agenda of the politicians. So the creation of jobs today, the creation of growth for countries, depends how good you are in science and innovation. And that's why in Europe we have uh, put forward this proposal of a program for science and innovation for the first time of 100 billion euros. And that's the proposal that we are discussing with the countries, uh, with the European Parliament, and it's focused on the ideas that we've developed uh, over the years in um, all these conversations that we had around the table here at Davos. I remember talking about open innovation. That's here that we had the, the idea of creating the European Innovation Council, which would be part of this 100 billion program. It is here that we come with our researchers. So we, we see their President Bourguignon, the president of the European Research Council, so they can tell their stories. And their stories are very powerful for the future of Europe. And it's here that we have our main vision of being open to the world. If we hear it's because in Europe we do believe that you can only do science, innovation, if you're open, uh, if you share knowledge, if you share data, if you share results. And so uh, I think there's very different views around the world about science, but our view is to be open, open in innovation, open in science, and open to the world. The second uh, part that I really would like to focus my visit here is about the role of science in democracies. And I think that we've had a uh, globalization of uh, all the, um, the chains of value of, uh, in the economic world, but what's the effect of technology in our daily life? What's the effect of technology in democracy? How can we look at it? How do we look at technology to reduce inequality, which is one of the major problems of today? How do we use blockchain or artificial intelligence to give purpose to our lives? And so I think that's the second part uh, that I want to focus as a co-chair with my colleagues. But um, uh, first and foremost, thank you to the forum. Thank you to the inspiration that we all get after a couple of days here. When we come back, we feel a little bit better than before. Thank you, Carlos. And Ken, uh, Huawei Technologies needs no introduction. I think probably half of uh, the folks in the audience have a Huawei in their pocket. Um, can you tell us what you are hoping to achieve from this meeting? Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to co-chair the Summer Davos uh, again. Um, uh, so as the only uh, Chinese member on the panel, so uh, firstly, please, uh, please allow me to welcome all of you to, to China. Uh, I've been uh, attending the World Economic Forum for over 10 years. And this is a fantastic platform to hear the different, vo uh, different voices to question, even to debate, and to drive the uh, reform. Uh, in the past, I've seen many incredible change driven by our web community around the world. Um, mm -hmm. The people like Professor Schwab has been actively 
uh, pushing many meaningful initiatives, including the fourth industrial revolution forward. So for this year, the topic uh, of the forum is something really close to my, to my heart because as an engineer graduate, I'm always excited about the technological innovation and particularly how it can help us to de develop our, our society. Um, I've been working in the information and communication industry for mm -hmm. almost 30 years. So in this journey, um, I got the chance to witness our industry has evolved from being a tool to help people communicate, to transform the way people work and, uh, and live. However, the real power of the digital technology is to help different other technologies to merge and trigger the disruption in the, in the, in the different domains. So for example, we see the blockchain used for food safety and the 3D printing used it to produce the alternative meat. And we also see the connected drones used it for uh, fighting the fire. So those informations are all something we never, we've never seen before. However, from my perspective, you know, the technological innovation doesn't stop there. Uh, we have to, we, in order to push the, the boundary of the technology further, we also need to change the way we look at the problems, because we're facing a lot of problems across the world. We have to change the way we look at the problems and to change the way we deal with these problems. That means we have to bring um, innovative policies, approaches, and even innovative uh, mindset to stay ahead of the transformation. transformation. And I believe the platform of WAF is the best place to do it. So as, a, uh, as the expectation to this year's forum, I would like to see the government, the academia, and the industry to get closer and to work together to establish the common goal and to stay ahead of the change. Obviously, we will talk about the technology. We will figure out how to encourage the investment in the technology. However, when we look at the future, let's not forget there are people that have been left behind. For example, we all have a smartphone. When we enjoy the latest smartphone and the super fast broadband network, the fact is right now there is still half of the world population doesn't have any internet access. So I believe this is a real gap and this is a gap we can deal with, we can well deal with, with innovative te technology, with innovative policies and mindset. So here in Tianjin, let's talk about how to harness the latest technology, and let's also develop a roadmap to make sure that this progress will be equal to everyone in the world, and is accessible to everyone in the world. And, do be, and I do believe that this is the right place to do it, and this is, this is the reason why we're here today. So thank you very much. Ken, thank you very much. Um, one of the huge uh, areas for research and technology development in the fourth industrial revolution is healthcare. So delighted to welcome Matt Hancock, the UK Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. Matt. New Shuman, Shang Shuman, Zha Zha Hao. It's great to be here as a co-chair of the World Economic Forum for the summer Davos, 
Uh, I think that the forum is a force for openness and progress, so it's an honour to be here as a co-chair uh, for the first time, not the tenth year, Ken. <laughs> um, and on such a critical subject, uh, I think that the question that's posed by the title of shaping the fourth industrial revolution is critical because we sometimes forget, given the scale of the changes, uh, that these changes are shaped by society and can be shaped by society. Um, there are, of course, huge opportunities from this new technology, uh, both to reach more people and ensure that more people are included in the uh, improvements around the world, um, and in my area specifically, uh, to make sure that we can uh, improve lives and ultimately save lives. I think that the combination of the role of genomics and understanding humanity at a molecular level and artificial intelligence and big data give us more opportunities than we've had f for a generation uh, to improve healthcare. Uh, for instance, this combination will help us to fight cancer in a way we haven't been able to before uh, and also to help people keep themselves healthy in a way uh, that hasn't been uh, possible through the use of artificial intelligence to help people look after themselves. Um, but shaping this technology also, of course, means making sure that we use it as a force for good and that we mitigate mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the risks. And um, you, you, we've talked about ethics already and the debate about the ethics of, uh, of, of big data uh, have been well trodden at um, uh, WEF events. Um, but they specifically hit the ground in individual areas, um, whether that's uh, uh, questions around privacy, for instance, uh, or, uh, in my case, questions around the use of uh, data and people's healthcare data. And I think making sure that we are as a society, as individual countries, and as much as possible as the world ahead of these questions, and we choose to shape the framework in which this technology is developed, that is critical to bringing people with us uh, as we harness the technology for the opportunities uh, that it undoubtedly brings. And so I hope that we can have lots of discussions um, this week about how we can shape the way that we use uh, modern technology so that the fourth industrial revolution works for the benefit of humanity uh, rather than running out of control. Thank you. McGill University, one of the leaders in, uh, in doing the kind of research that's forging ahead and creating this revolution. Uh, can I turn to you, uh, Suzanne, to uh, talk a little bit about what your role Merci. is in Merci, bonjour, good morning. Uh, I first want to thank the World Economic Forum for uh, inviting me to participate in this great meeting. It is an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, of course, we all see the changes. We all see the pace of change. Uh, it is staggering, and this is something we will notice, we will see, we will witness right here. Uh, we see new technologies appearing every day, disruptive technologies, and in our research labs, we see those new discoveries, transformative discoveries that will bring even more disruption in those technologies. But I think we all know and we all see the social disruptions. And also we observe are ill-prepared we are for some of these disruptions, whether it is in our governance structure, in our legal framework, in ethical consideration, we haven't figured it out. This meeting, I think, is a great opportunity because it brings together thought leaders and also actors in this fourth industrial revolution. So it brings us together so we can talk about some of these big issues. And one of the things I always say about the World Economic Forum is that it's the most powerful telescope we have to look into the future. And, uh, and it is so because of the great convening power of the forum, it brings together people of every, every areas and allows us to look in the future. But of course, we're not here only as observers. We're here because we have the capacity to lead and to shape 
the future. In my own sector, in the university sector, I would say that the most important question right now is how do we deliver our extremely important role of social inclusion, of a motor of social inclusion? How do we do that today when we have to bring to our university people from many, many different places, not only places in the world, places in societies also. People who never participated, were not able to participate in higher education before. People who did participate and find themselves in the middle of their career ill-equipped to continue working in the area they are working and need to upskill, reskill, so that they can continue to keep a job. So we're seeing our world open up to a much more diverse group of learners and people from all over the world. And we all know that although there's a very catchy title, the world is flat, when it comes to opportunities and opportunities for le learning, it isn't flat. And so how can people in universities that have had the great opportunity open their door even larger so that they can welcome these new learners into their community? So I have great expectation for the meeting because the name of the meeting is New Champions. So I'm hoping that at the end of the meeting, I will be able to see that there are many more people who are willing to be champions in these changes. Champions of science and technology, because we have to face some backlash at times towards science and technology. We need people who are there to talk about the benefit of science and technology, but also champions of social inclusion. I've always believed that if you want to change the world or carve the future, shape the future, what you need most are champions. Merci. Thank you, Suzanne. And Jay, you're busy putting some of this technology to use in biotech and life science with Illumina. So could you share with us some of your hopes and expectations? Sure. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm absolutely honored to be here and privileged to share the uh, the panel with my other co-hosts uh, of this meeting. Uh, Illumina is about a $50 billion market cap company that supplies uh, tools uh, for genomic analysis. Uh, my expectation here is, is to really push forward that focus on science, technology, and innovation. But perhaps even more importantly, in an area of personal for focus for me, is the implications of that technology on the healthcare system uh, and in society at large. And if you think about the progress of the technology, when the first genome was done, it cost $100 million. It took all the machines in the world a year to do it. Uh, in 2007, it cost a million dollars, and one machine could do it in three years. And now uh, we can sequence a genome uh, on one machine about every hour, and it costs under $1,000. And the implication of that uh, is that this is the century of biology, and we will have radical revolutions um, in the use of that biological information in terms of how we uh, define healthcare, how we manage healthcare, and how we ultimately prevent disease. Uh, the implications are broad here across rare disease diagnosis, uh, reproductive health, oncology, neurologic disease. Much of that has genetic underpinnings that the technology uh, is and will be driving forward. But of course, the, the long range question, and I think some of the issues that are going to come up at this meeting, have to do with the, uh, the side effects of that technology on society, issues around equivalent access to that technology, uh, security, data privacy, uh, storage of data, the application of artificial intelligence, and the changing role uh, in that paradigm of the physician who in not very many years out will no longer be able to diagnose their patients. That will all be done through some artificial intelligence system uh, looking at the phenotype and the genotype of that patient. The implications on how healthcare gets delivered uh, as a result of that will be really transformative in the role of uh, the insurance industry as well. Uh, and the regulatory industries need to change quite radically uh, under this new paradigm. So uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to learn more in the next couple of days to participate uh, with others in this meeting to try to push this agenda forward, uh, to understand much more deeply the implications of this, and to push forward the public-private partnerships that WEF is so good in uh, implementing uh, to help bring this kind of technology to the globe on an equal access basis. So thank you very much, and again, appreciate being here. Jay, thank you, and thanks to all our coaches.
Uh, looking at my watch and running on Swiss time, I note that we have a terribly tiny uh, amount of time to ask some questions. If I can just see from a quick show of hands who has a question, and ideally it's something that each of our co-chairs can have a crack at answering. Now, if you can tell us your name and where you're from, uh, can we fit five in? Uh, let me see if I can take them all down and throw them at all of our co-chairs. I'm going to start with the lady there. If you could just tell us your name and where you're from, mm -hmm. and I will note them down and we'll try and mush them together. Okay, for everyone thank to you. Hi, I'm Tong Yang from Jinso Finance. And my question is uh, for, actually for Mr. Hu and for Moidas. Both of you mentioned blockchain just now. And uh, how do you think it will influence our life or uh, in every aspect? And how do you think uh, cryptocurrency? Thank you. Yeah, impact of blockchain, that will be a, a quick one. Yes or no? <laughs> OK, uh, gentlemen there. Uh, Hello, my name is Zhang Zhongwan. Can you just slow down? I'm just putting on my headphone. Hi, my name is Zhang Zhongwan. I'm from Zhejiang Journal, Zhejiang Daily. And my question is for Mr. Flatley from Illumina. Hua um, Dajing. It's a Chinese company on genomes. It produces machines which are much cheaper than foreign ones. You mentioned biotechnology that gives more opportunities to people in all ways. So um, when I'd like to ask about the cost of such machines, what's your idea on Chinese machines and your machines in Lumina? What would be the differences? and the perspective in the future. Thank you. Oh. It's a very specific question. Zhou uh, Chen from Caixin Media. I'd like to ask Huawei Corporation's Ms. Hu about uh, what's your feeling of uh, Huawei's forbidden to cooperate in the building of 5G in America, Australia, and other countries, and about the trade war between China and America. What's the uh, right. what's your good, <laughs> perspective? Good Okay, gentlemen there, and then gentlemen there, and then I think we'll try and see if we can spread those thank questions you. around. Uh, thank you, uh, Yang Hongming from GMA News. I want to raise this question to uh, Mr. Hancock. And my question is about what do you think the AI can change in our life, especially uh, where we can use AI technology to help the African countries or less develop, developing con developed countries to treat their uh, people and to give their too much care? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and gentlemen there. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Daniel Shane from CNN. Uh, my question is for Mr. Hu as well. Um, kind of extension, what is your opinion on Donald Trump's decision today to uh, impose new tariffs on uh, Chinese imports? And how do you see these trade tensions between the US and China eventually being resolved? Thank you. Great. So um, we've got the future of blockchain and cryptocurrency, which I'll ask um, our co-chairs to answer with a thumbs up or thumbs down. <laughs> um, not quite. But um, uh, we have the cost of technology for Jay, and we have then questions on AI and uh, on, on trade wars. So um, I'm going to start very quickly by just uh, turning to Abby and, so, and asking that question on blockchain and, um, and crypto, and just saying, you know, are you, you're of a generation where those technologies mm -hmm. are going to make an enormous difference on the decades of life ahead of you. What, uh, what do you see coming out of them? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the potential of blockchain goes far beyond cryptocurrencies. That's a very volatile market. We see a lot of fluctuations. And I think what is really revolutionary about blockchain is the capacity to distribute information. So any centralized monopoly, whether it's a government or whether it's the energy sector or whether it's the finance sector, where information and power is stored in one, um, in, in a very centralized way, this has the capacity to distribute that information and potentially make those kinds of systems much more democratic. But I think there is a lot in terms of how concentration of information even within blockchain can lead to further monopolies. But I think ultimately it's about being able to distribute power and distribute information. And I think that's potentially more powerful than cryptocurrency itself. OK, 
can I just add something? Mm. I think that politically is probably one of the most interesting tools for our future because uh, I'm not interested in cryptocurrencies, but I'm interested in the fact that blockchain can help me changing the way politicians have behaved in the last 100 years. Mm -hmm. So each time you want to redistribute health, wealth, uh, you would do it through taxes. And here you can really think about a system where you can, before inequality, happens, how can you redistribute wealth from the beginning without intermediaries? And I think that uh, that idea is very strong and I think that the politicians of the future will use it in a very different way, a way of changing the political speech that has been just focused on the fiscal side, on the tax side, more to the technology. So I think that blockchain can help a lot in the future uh, for politicians that want to have a different view in the world and that can change uh, the world in a different way. And in our field, there's, there's two important potential applications as well. One is um, for privacy purposes, the ability to anonymize genomic information so that researchers can share pieces of genomes that are encrypted using blockchain technology without ever revealing the uh, origin of that source. The second important way is for tracking value because data sharing is critically important uh, in many uh, institutes that have large data sets are reluctant to share because they don't get economic value back. The blockchain can help track that value through the chain and, and reward the inventors of that value. Ken. Yeah, I'd like to have a few words uh, about the uh, blockchain. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the, uh, the, the Bitcoin, uh, but I'd like to share my perspective from the technology portfolio. Because so when we look at the future world, it will be a fully connected and fully intelligent world. And that will, will be uh, supported by a bunch of technology. So we talk about the uh, IoT, which is, uh, uh, which is going to help us to get all the data uh, from every corner of the world. And then we talk about the uh, broadband, which will help us to transfer the data to the cloud. Uh, and then the cloud computing and the artificial intelligence. And from the technology perspective, I think the blockchain will probably be a very important piece of puzzle to make the whole uh, you know, technology portfolio trusted and safe. So it is very important. And my opinion is that you know, for, for any uh, industry, for any government organizations, we should you know, brave the you know, uh, technology of uh, blockchain. We can ac actually you know, use it in any of our you know, business operation or the public service. Uh, so uh, it, it's very important. Yeah. Matt, you were asked about the benefits and potentials of AI in uh, helping. Yes, I think, I think the uh, potentials are very significant, um, both in terms of um, the high research, which is perhaps more obvious of, uh, ha of uh, tackling um, a disease and illness, as Jay was not only talking about, but Jay's company is a world leader uh, in, in, in delivering on. Um, but also, actually, in empowering citizens to manage their own health, and I think this is really interesting. So uh, we, uh, we have two companies in the British delegation here at the, um, at the WEF um, who provide AI to GP surgeries to allow your a general practitioner anywhere in the world uh, to um, uh, to be able to diagnose better a patient's um, illness or concerns. Um, so my GP and Ada Digital Health they're rolling out across the UK, but they're looking to roll out across the world. And this can also have an impact on health inequalities um, because. Whilst they augment and support a, um, a, a general practice doctors where they exist, they also can hugely empower somebody who doesn't have access to primary care but does have access to the internet to be able to improve their own health care. So I think that it, it, the, there's, there's the potential for improvements in health care right from the high research all the way through to um, practice right on the ground. Mm -hmm. I thought it was, I've got one small thing to say about the blockchain because people worry that it's just a buzzword and there's been a lot of hype, but I think we're now moving to the phase where we're seeing some practical examples. In the UK, for instance, we now distribute uh, foreign aid money, uh, including the, um, the, the, the assurance of the distribution through a blockchain technology, which allows you to follow the money right down to the, in, the final recipient, whereas in the past, aid money 
um, has, there's been a concern that aid money has ended up in um, uh, funding the wrong people and there's been corruption concerns around it. Uh, this allows us to track aid money right down to the intended recipient and then audit better. So there's a very practical example of how it can help to improve, uh, improve governance and, uh, and improve lives. Great. Suzanne, then we'll just briefly tackle an issue that I think has just come up with the 200 billion, but I know that uh, because we've deprived our panelists of phones for the last half hour, they won't have seen exactly what those tariffs are. Yeah, I just want to say just a few words about AI and health, because in my uh, university at McGill, one of the big area of research is the brain. Uh, we happen to know very little about the brain still and uh, need to use all we can to uh, discover the brain. So AI is being used for diagnostic purposes. As you know, it's very difficult to identify Alzheimer early on. And there have been many now areas of research that shows that we can do better uh, using AI. So it's used at the beginning. It's, of course, used in the whole uh, drug discovery part so that we can treat people, but it's also very useful to help people who are suffering from the disease in dealing with day-to-day -day life. So it goes through the full spectrum of our uh, health care uh, uh, delivery. Thank you. And maybe just to turn, in the last half hour, there has been um, uh, an announcement that some 200 billion uh, in, in tariffs have been imposed by the US. Um, uh, I know none of you will have had a chance to mm -hmm. digest that fully, but um, uh, a couple of words perhaps uh, on, on the importance of, of keeping trade open and free and fair. Mm -hmm. Carlos, perhaps, do you want to kick uh, off? Yes, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you all know the, the view of the European Union. I think that the European Union has the vision that openness is the way to go, that each time we got into any kind of trade war, it doesn't end well, and um, uh, we just uh, don't agree with that. So uh, the European Union vision for the future is about increasing trade globally, but at the same time, uh, as you increase trade globally, you have to make sure that you can get everyone in that economic uh, growth. And so you have to have measures that are social, uh, that you can help everyone to participate uh, in the growth. I think that the problem today is that we had globalization taking a lot of people out of poverty, but a lot of people also in our societies, especially in the West, have been actually getting in a way uh, worse off than their parents. And so you have to create a more civilized way of uh, getting this globalization out. But it's not with a trade war that will solve that. So the vision of the European Union is that uh, trade wars do not solve anything. It's actually the contrary. Uh, you saw that uh, historically. You look in terms of the First World War, the Second World War, and each time you have done protectionism, each time you have reduced the global trade, uh, people get worse off and that uh, that's something that is uh, for me very strange that um, economically politicians seem not to have learned the lesson and uh, uh, the examples are out there in our history so um, uh, just to be very clear about what the European Union vision is but at the same time each time someone attacks the European Union with any kind of terrorists the European Union will uh, answer back at the same time the same thing to China or other parts of the world so um, uh, yes it's a reality that we are living but it's not a reality that we agree in the European Union Ken how does that um, hit you the lady also asked from Kaijin about the 5g network that you're currently locked out of um, of being involved with um, the, the 5g is a new technology the standard was uh, just uh, finalized. The first standard of 5G was uh, just uh, finalized in June this year, and this is a big step forward. And yeah, we've been working with uh, uh, many of our customers for, say, more than 50 pre-commercial uh, 5G network around the world, and we also secure some uh, uh, commercial contract in the, in the different markets. And we observed some challenges um, from this uh, pre-commercial trial. And one of the challenges is that uh, there is a lack of understanding of the safety of 5G, because 5G is a, is a, is a new technology. And um, 
Yeah, somebody questioned that, you know, whether uh, 5G is safer than 4G, and the answer is yes, 5G is actually safer than 4G. Let me share with you some of the detail from the technology perspective. Because firstly, um, in the 3G, uh, 3GPP standard, because uh, 5G standard was uh, developed by the, by the organization of 3GPP, the security and the safety has been highly considered uh, during the whole process. So in the, in the standard, um, there is a dedicated security group for the, for, the, for the 5G. Thousands of experts from dozens of companies have working on that, and they have designed um, the different you know, aspect uh, for the 5G security. For, for example, the architecture of the 5G uh, is safer than 4G. It is a layer architecture, and somebody misunderstood uh, that, oh, the uh, core network and the access network should be converged, converged in the 5G. That's not true. Actually, no matter it's from a technology perspective or from the standard perspective, the core and the access uh, is still separated. And in the, in the application of the 5G, obviously, it will carry on huge amount of data. So the data transmission should be a serious, a serious consideration in the 5G. And in the 3G PP standard, there are a lot of measures has been taken to protect the, the transmission of data. For example, um, we introduced enhanced encryption in the data transmission protection. In the 4G, in the existing 4G technology, it's, two, uh, it's 128 bit. But in 5G, it's double. It's 256. We all know that. That's a huge improvement on the protection of the data transmission. So generally speaking, um, 5G is a new technology and it's safer than our 4G technology. So not opinion is that, as a new technology, uh, while, you, while you're going to assess the uh, risk of this technology, you first uh, uh, need to look at the te technology itself. Uh, but disappointing, you know, in some of the markets, there are some you know, interference uh, from the political side in the technology selection. Uh, I don't think that's good, that's helpful. Matt, uh, Britain, the long-standing champion, probably the longest-standing global champion of free trade. Is it uh, something you look at with uh, askance when you see these new tariffs being uh, loaded on? Well, as you say, we're a, the UK has long been, throughout history, uh, been a champion of free trade, and we remain a champion of free trade now, and uh, that's, what we, that's what we want to see. And likewise, we've been working with Huawei for many years to put 5G into action. Big thanks to all our co-chairs. I'm going to get in trouble for keeping them rather longer than uh, intended. Uh, I know you'll have a chance to address individually with each of them anything you want to follow up with throughout the next couple of days. Uh, wish all of you a very good meeting, and thanks for joining us here. Thank you.